HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. The following program has been brought to you by Barterhouse Wines. For more information, visit www.thebarterhouse.com. Broadcasting live from Roberta's in Bushwick, Brooklyn, you're listening to HeritageRadioNetwork.com. All right, everybody, once again, it's Thursday, 1 o'clock, and you have tuned into the Heritage Radio Network, coming to you live from the back of Roberta's in Bushwick, Brooklyn. You're listening to The Farm Report, and I am your host, Aaron Fairbanks. Today, we are on the line with Jesse LaFlame of Pete and Jerry's. Jesse, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Welcome to the show. So great to have you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So, Pete and Jerry's is not a cartoon with, like, a cat and a mouse. It is actually an egg company uh, up in Monroe, New Hampshire, but not just any egg company. Why don't you give us a little bit of history on the operation? I understand it was started by your great-grandfather. Right. Uh, shortly after World War II, he, uh, he came back to the area where he grew up. And, of course, he grew up on a dairy farm or a diversified farm. And his brothers had taken over the, the family dairy and... Uh, really kind of bought up a few of the other dairies right in the immediate area, and he thought to himself, you know, chickens, eggs, it doesn't take a lot of land, I might as well uh, give that a shot. So he started out very, very small, uh, about 500 hens, I think, at the time, and uh, slowly over the next uh, two decades built it up uh, with some other family members into a, uh, a thriving local conventional egg supplier. And uh, we, uh, my, my father, uh, actually took it over, I think it was in the early 80s, uh, and it continued as a small farm, but uh, the industry, quote-unquote, the ind- egg industry was changing very rapidly along with the supermarket industry at that time with just unbelievable consolidation, industrialization in a lot of ways. And a, uh, a small egg farm, I think we had uh, 70,000 hens at the most at the time, um, just couldn't couldn't cut it, wouldn't cut it. Uh, small farm, a uh, smaller farm became uh, a million hens in one place. Wow, okay. So, uh, yeah, just, uh, it's really pretty remarkable. Um, they're, they're now putting a quarter million to a half million hens in a single barn. Uh, we can talk some more about that. But, uh, so they so they really couldn't compete. And uh, my, my parents grew up uh, during the 70s, came of age during the 70s, and, and were a little uh, back to earth. Uh, always had organic on their mind, and uh, always wanted to be farmers, of course. And and they were they had the foresight uh, to start experimenting with producing organic eggs, and it worked. And before long, um, you know, we were tearing out the cages, and they're gone. They're gone for good. And we now produce uh, organic and cage-free eggs exclusively, and we do it with a lot of other family farms, which is probably, in my opinion, one of the most important things that we do. So it's been it's been quite a journey. And we've really been lucky to grow. Yeah, it sounds thing. like it. So what is your role uh, in the operation? I'm really kind of managing everything day to day. So I don't know. don't really like titles around here, but I guess I would be president uh, or CEO or something. But, uh, you know, with the size of, of the farm and the business, I mean, we're, we're, we're larger, but we're still, I mean, it's very hands-on. I may be working with the hens one day, 
meeting with a customer the next day, trying to work out a distribution issue later on. So it's a little bit of everything, Okay, which is great. And now, yeah, it was a little unclear to me when I was checking out your site earlier. So you guys produce organic eggs and non-organic eggs, or you're... What, well, you, you do both or you do one or the other or you're transitioning? Uh, we, do, we do both. So we don't do any conventional type eggs produced in, in cages, okay. um, battery cage. So everything, everything is sort of humane. In fact, everything we do is certified humane. Yeah, you guys so, do have that. Sort of, that's a tough certification too. Congratulations. Thank you very much. We're, yeah, we're quite proud of that. And we were the first egg farm in the country to, to do it and to be a part of it. You know, the program's continually evolving, and, and so are we. So it's a, it's, it's a great program for all types of livestock. But, uh, yeah, we, we, found, we started with organic, but we found that there was actually a, a market niche for cage-free eggs because they are produced with conventional grains. Uh, they're not as expensive. So there are people that are worried about primarily animal welfare, but not so much about organic issues. So sure. it's a good fit for them. Um, and, and to be honest, we started that pretty early on when we were – we were producing too many organic eggs. We couldn't sell them all, uh, so it was kind of a, a little bit of a alternative to you know not not even break even, but lose a little less money if we uh, if we had to sell extra eggs during certain times of the year. Right. But it's really grown and taken on its own legs, uh, where we have a lot of flocks that are just dedicated to cage-free egg production. Right. And the chickens are the same. The growing practices are the same. It's just the feed that's different. Is that right? That's that's exactly it. Yeah. The barns are almost identical. Uh, really very, very similar. There's, there's not much difference at all, just those grains. And organic grains are, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big, big believer in organic, um, but organic grains are expensive. That's the one, that's the one, one reason, uh, you know, there's a million reasons to buy organic food. The one, one reason not to is because it's expensive. Sure. And can you give us a sense, I mean, be, between an organic kind of feed mix and a non-organic just as a percentage, or like, what what is the difference in cost there? Organic grain, it's it, they don't always move together, but typically the, the the grain ration for the hens, which is mostly corn and soybean and some wheat and flaxseed and alfalfa and some other things, but mostly corn and soybean, um, it can tend to in organic, it's generally at least double. Um, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, so it it adds a lot of cost, and we feed. We feed the hens organic grain uh, from their second day of, of life, really, uh, as soon as we get the chicks. So that, you know, it all kind of adds cost over, over time. Absolutely. Well, let's, I would, what I would love to do with you is kind of start at, at the beginning and just kind of, if you can walk us through um, what are some of the different decisions and kind of how the chickens spend their life and then, I, you know, talk a little bit about your processing and distribution network. So, you guys do work with a hatchery in upstate New York, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's our, our largest supplier, and they're a small family-run hatchery. They do a really, really nice job. Uh, so, you know, we like, to, we like to work with smaller companies when we can, and, and that's kind of, I mean, it's, it's a funny process when the chicks, when the chicks show up. Um, and to give people an idea, I, I, I hen barn, uh, you know, these are bigger than backyard flocks, but they'll hold typically between... 5,000 and really at the most uh, like 19,000 hens, which, again, to some people probably sounds like a lot, but in a, in a day and age where there aren't many people involved in farming and, and caged barns hold a quarter million hens in each, they're really pretty small. So uh, the, with the baby chicks, they show up on, uh, we call it the chick truck, and uh, it, it shows up with baskets of 100 baby chicks in each, and uh, we put the, the chicks out on shavings, for their first few weeks of life, and, and it's, uh, it's kind of a warm, <laughs> it's, it's a nice, warm, cozy environment. They have feed and, and water anywhere they want it, and the, and the chicks are just hilarious when they first come in. Just these little balls of fuzz, and they sort of, they, they move around in groups and uh, <laughs> throughout the house, and they follow, uh, if, you're, if you're in the barn with somebody and, and, and talking to a person, if, if you stand 20 feet apart, Inevitably, there'll be a group of chicks that will uh, congregate in between you, and whoever's talking, the chicks will run to that person. And then, when the conversation gets to the other person, they'll run back. Uh, so that's always a lot of fun when they when they come. Uh, we raise them until about 16 or 17 weeks of age, in, in that separate uh, growing growing space, uh-huh. and then they're brought to the main farm or to our farmers, and uh, where where the egg laying happens. And uh, to describe those barns, uh, they're they're sort of these big, wide open spaces with uh, uh, 
the, the key part of it is, is nesting, roosting, and feeding systems within the, the barn. So, oh wait, um, you know what? I want to. Can I interrupt? For, I want to hold up one second because yeah. I have a few questions about the. So the hatchery. Uh, I, and I, I'm, I don't know this, you know, obviously there's not a big use for, for male chickens in an egg farm because they don't, they don't lay eggs. So right. is, is, um, how, how is the egg, egg to, or the hatching technology evolved? Can they, can they, can they breed or, or I'm not sure what the terminology is. Maybe you can help me out for a particular sex or do they sex them at birth and kind of what, what happens to the males and kind of how does that work? Um, at the very sure. kind of beginning stages? Sure. No, and it's an important question. It's an important thing for people to know. We like to be as honest as possible. And it's, and it's actually it's one of the reasons we work with this hatchery in upstate New York. So there, scientists are working on technology to, to basically sex the chicks when they're, when they're in the egg. They have not fully developed that yet. So males are hatched out, um, and you know, males in agriculture... A uh, friend of mine, an egg farmer, always says, you know, being a, being a male in agriculture is good work if you can get it. Well, um, yeah, and that's true for, for every, you know, for all livestock, for really. All, yeah. Right, all types of livestock. So, I, you know, again, perfectly honest, the, the male hens, the, the vast majority of them are, are euthanized. And the way that's done at this hatchery, and again, it's why we work with them, is they're, they're basically uh, they're put into the baskets and, and uh, CO2 gas is used to do that. So it's a very calm, um, humane way to do it. I think it's probably the most humane way that you could do it. Sure. I mean, obviously yeah. it also falls under your certification. So, I mean, that is kind of the industry standard. And I'm assuming that then, you know, the ratio is somewhere around 50-50 as, um, as it is generally in nature? Or Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, cool. So, so, so it's, you know, it's uh, it's one of the one of the more unfortunate things, and we're just we're reading and waiting and can't wait until you know the science is developed that 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 doesn't need to happen. But uh, you know, at this point, we're doing the the best we can. Yeah, no, of course, and and I you know it's something I'm constantly surprised myself by these kind of obvious natural facts about uh, food production that are just not on my radar at all, and. You know, having spent a lot of time, especially this past year, talking about the role of males on farms in general, in particular with a goat project that I was working on early this year, it, I, I never even thought about it with with chickens, even though I, I knew that. And and you know, that is one of those one of those issues that I think is just kind of really off the radar for obvious reasons. So let's not right. dwell in it anymore. I guess <laughs> I just wanted to I just wanted to share that because I you know I think it is like one of those important considerations when people are like making choices about what to eat to really kind of understand kind of the whole production scope. So you have the chicken, you get the chicks, um, they spend the first 16 to 17 weeks in a separate barn. And then at that point, are they starting to lay or do they have a little transition when they move into the laying area before they start to, to produce they're eggs? Just, yeah, they're just about to, usually about a week or two at the most away from, from starting to lay some eggs. So when they move into the laying barns, we have these uh, these nest systems, which are pretty cool. They're called community nests, and they actually look like they look like a row of dog houses, one one right after the other, and uh, with a you know sort of four foot opening and uh, red curtains. Hands like their privacy. Uh, <laughs> they can go in, and there's uh, there's uh, it, the floor is actually uh, sloped, and it's and it's astroturf. So they go in and scratch around a little bit and make themselves a nest, basically, with you know they're where they're content. And uh, lay an egg. And some of the hens, uh, we call them broody hens, they like to spend all day on the nest if they can, and, and they think that they're sitting on their eggs and everyone else's. And then there are the social butterflies who like to get in and out as quickly as possible and, and get on with uh, eating and socializing. Uh, so the, the nests are a big part of it. And then, then feeding uh, and watering and roosting and, and scratching is another big piece. Uh, the barns, and, and it's actually as part of Certified Humane Standards, there has to be at least 15% of the surface, the floor area in the barn, um, that the hens can scratch around. And that's a big deal for hens. You know, it's, a, it's a very big natural behavior for them to, to scratch and look for, you know, I mean, the instinct is to look for bugs and insects and, and everything else that they do. Uh, and, and feed is, is always available in front of the hens. Um, the feed, feed systems run you know, and, and run out a good depth of feed at least seven times a day. Water's always available. 
and uh, roosting because there's always timid hens that, that want to get up. You know, they, they go down and they eat, and then they get back up on a roost and kind of get out of the fray uh, from the other hens. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good life uh, inside those barns when they're inside. Nice, nice, nice way to be. Yeah. What is there, Do you guys work with a particular uh, breed of chicken? Yeah, we, we like, uh, it's, a, it's a breed called a, a Babcock Brown which uh, I guess originates from France, and they're all sort of, um, you know, derivations of a white leghorn mixed with a New Hampshire red or something like that, or Rhode Island red. Uh, So they're, you know, they're definitely, um, they're they're sort of uh, bred to to lay a lot of eggs. I mean, that's that's important. Of course. Uh, To to, uh, to make sure that we can sell the eggs as inexpensively as possible, but... uh, they're funny. I mean, they're all they're all personality, and they are busy, and they are social. Um, Jesse, we're going to take a quick break, but before we do, can you let us know what is the website? So you have some great pictures of the hens and of kind of the barns where they live, and I want people to be able to take a look at that during the break if if they want. Oh, cool! Yes, it's uh, www.peteandjerrys.com, and it's Jerry with a G. Awesome. Um, and it's spelled out, so peteandjerrys.com. All right, we'll take a quick minute, and we'll come back, and we'll talk about the egg side of the chicken production. open the bottle and you drink the wine, it speaks for itself. Is it, you know, a wine that's made for food? Yes. Those types of wines are tend to be more rustic or have a little bit more body. Are there wines that are just pure out hedonistic pleasure? Sure. There's wines like that that maybe from California that are more cocktail wines or wines that are just big jammy fruit bombs. And those, I think, appeal to a certain group, group of people as well. I think the wines that Barterhouse specializes in is more of these food-friendly, you know, rustic style um, biodynamic organic wines that tend to be a bit more earthy come from someplace so you can almost taste the terroir you can almost feel this guy this sancera was grown in this slaty rocky soil and so to me that's the exciting part that the wine feels like it comes from someplace all right we're bringing it back we are talking eggs on the line with jesse laflame of pete and jerry's uh, so jesse before the break we were talking about um kind of how the space is where the, the chickens are laying their eggs and how does the collection work? And I mean, in my head, I'm imagining this kind of Veruca salt contraption where the egg like drops into some magical system, but it, is that how it works or are they collected by hand? I mean, when you have that many eggs, like how does that work? It's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool and it's actually relatively simple uh, because the, that AstroTurf floor is, is slope, the eggs just sort of roll back through and they roll back behind the nest where there's uh, a belt, a conveyor belt. And some of these belts can be, you know, a couple hundred, several hundred feet long. Uh, and they'll be, you know, by the middle of the day, they'll just be full of eggs. So the conveyor belts run forward where the, he- the eggs are either collected by hand or, uh, or by mechanical systems that will put six eggs in an egg tray or, or other conveyor systems at a time. So it's, it's, uh, it's relatively simple, and it's a pretty cool process. It's, I mean, the labor reduction um, is pretty remarkable compared to what my grandfather used to do when he you know, very first started and, and even my, my great-grandfather and great-uncle uh, who did a little bit with eggs. So very, very different. Um, and that's one of the great things, I mean, with, with organic and, and cage-free production uh, growing in popularity, um, farming, type of farming growing, that the companies that make this type of equipment have started concentrating on this again and, and coming up with inventive new ways to collect the eggs and not have them damaged and, and make the entire thing more efficient. So it yeah. helps, uh, helps with the cost. So you have, now you have uh, the your original facility, but then you guys also partner with a number of family farms from the region. So how do the eggs from those farms kind of make their way to the production? Because there's just one production facility, correct, for the washing and packaging? We're, we've actually started working with another uh, family operation that has uh, a standalone egg processing plant closer to some of the farms that we work with and they're they're doing a great job you know 
know, with our with our oversight. Uh, so that's helping. It's you know it's all about cutting down on on food miles. But uh, yeah, the the family farms. This is one of the things that I'm you know it's it's just a mission of ours. It's one of the things I'm most proud of. Uh, you know we're we're lucky. We're we're growing really quickly, and and we're in a, in a area that's growing really quickly. And, and traditionally, in in this egg industry, um, you know it's, it's been vertical integration. Get get rid of uh, all the you know farmers that you might be working with. Do it all yourself. Uh, get rid of the feed mill. You can do it yourself. You know all these things um, that make these companies big industrial agribusinesses. Right. And you know we step back and as we started to grow and you know we built a few barns here and there on our own site and said you know wait a minute this isn't what our customers want to see us do. Um, you know this isn't what we're about. So we started partnering with family farms. Throughout the Northeast, and you know, the, we're now actually within a few months. I think we're going to be close to 30 family farms that we're working with, and they're really of all sizes and just you know, remarkable people who just want to be farmers. You know, they don't want to they don't want to process eggs, right. they don't want to sell eggs. You know, they don't want to deal with all the the headaches of having too many eggs or not enough eggs and food safety audits. Although they do go through some of those for us, but uh, you know, all those things that we we deal with, they just want to be farmers and. Uh, now that that sounds basic, but in today's agriculture, that's actually becoming hard to do. Um, you know, these big farms, even if families own them, they're not. You know, they're not. They're not so much farmers anymore. They're managers of people and assets. Yeah, um, and I think you know, it, kind it, of, you're touching on some of the realities of of what we pay, what we as consumers pay for when we make selections in the grocery store. I mean, obviously. The reason people, the reason the food system has moved towards the vertical integrated systems is because you can make more money, like fewer people can make more money. And, and, and the model that you guys are choosing to engage with spreads that money out across a, a variety of people. All of the different farms that you work with, in addition to the feed mills and the hatcheries. And, you know, if you guys were doing that all yourself, all those different families would would not be able to kind of support themselves in the same way. And I, I think that's that's a really admirable mission for a company to take on because it is taking a step away from just a strictly profit-driven incentive. Well, thank you. And, and that's, you know, we feel, that, we feel that's what our customers would expect of us. And that's what we're doing. And, and uh, you know, and make no mistake about it, I mean, the farmers we're working with, you know, they're, they're entrepreneurs too. I mean, it's, it's you know, they're running... They're running small businesses too, and I have so much respect for these people that you know they're, they're taking on a lot of debt to build a barn uh, to take care of hens for us. You know, it's it's uh, and they work seven days a week. You know, it's quite quite admirable. So how? Um, well, uh, let's not jump around too much here. I guess I want to stay on track. So how how is it that the eggs go from the farms to the um, to the kind of packing um, sites? Sure. So on. On each of the contract farms, they they typically, well, sort of at the end of that conveyor belt that's within the nest, they um, they'll have a, a hand packing area, or they'll actually have one of those packing machines that put six eggs on a on a tray at a time, and they're they're packed on egg flats. We call them. People have probably seen those. They hold thirty eggs uh, at a time, and, and they build a stack of six of those. And we have these special pallet systems that uh, <coughs> hold layers of these of these flats. And it's typically 900 dozen to a pallet. Um, so they'll sort of build these pallets, and they'll have a, a cooler on site that they keep them in um, for a few days or for up to a week, um, which is uh, still very fresh. And we'll, uh, we'll send our trucks around. Um, and typically, our trucks will leave the egg processing plant here full of eggs uh, to go out to the markets uh, or distributors for delivery. And rather than having them come back empty, we have our trucks go out to these family farms and, and pick, uh, pick up. eggs up. So it's, you know, food miles, it's always a complicated uh, complicated issue, um, very complicated. It's sort of like wine from California actually has a higher carbon footprint than wine from France if it's going to New York City, uh, that kind of thing. It's always complicated, but, but we're, uh, you know, we look at the food miles as really being, you know, how far the driver has to go from the last delivery stop to go out to the farm and then return to the processing plant. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, the system works, works really pretty well. Uh, and from there, the, uh, in the processing plant, the eggs are, are uh, basically put on uh, 
talking about Rube Goldberg machines. It's, it's a pretty crazy uh, Rube Goldberg uh, egg processing machine that, that has been developed for the sort of commercial egg industry where you know, millions of eggs go through these machines in a day in some cases. Uh, but they're set on, on the system where they're, where they're washed and with the organic eggs, we have to actually use an organic approved, uh, very light detergent. and they're, they're scrubbed in hot water and use a, a really light uh, sanitizing rinse, which is, which is a light chlorine usually. Not that many parts per million. They're dried, uh, inspected, and then weighed. Um, they're checked for cracks with an acoustic system, uh, huh. which is pretty cool too. They can actually, uh, yeah, find find the cracks and find where the crack is uh, and how bad it is. And those are rejected, of course. And then the eggs are uh, put in the cartons, put into cases, and sent uh, sent out to market. So it's a relative, you know, it's it's a pretty pretty streamlined and pretty efficient process. And we turn our eggs around as quickly as we can. Uh, really, freshness is, is a big deal uh, for us and for our customers. Sure, sure. So the eggs that need, why, why is it that the eggs need to get washed? I mean, and, and why is it that detergent is, is something that's, like, necessary? And, and Sure. Yeah. It, it's, uh, well, the funny thing is in, in Europe, it's actually a USDA requirement that eggs are washed. And in Europe, it's actually a requirement that they not be washed. Um, and, of course, they don't refrigerate over there. So it's, you know, I guess it's some of it's our preoccupation with sanitation, which is sometimes misguided in this country, as we know. Um, so it's, I mean, it, the, the reason, is it a necessity? You know, I really don't think so. I mean, I, I guess the logic is that if there was some sort of contamination on the shell and somebody cracked it, cracked it and, you know, there was intermingling, but that could be an issue. Right. But uh, they, seem, they seem to do pretty well over in Europe without issue. Right. And that's not an uh, option that you guys are choosing. That's that's the requirement. Right. Right. Exactly. And and when I say detergent, um, people are thinking laundry detergent. It is not that. It's again, it's an organic approved uh, substance. So it's actually it's actually uh, a citrus based uh, product that we use, and it. And it just uh, basically kind of increases the uh, the pH and and does some things to help help the wash process remove uh, you know any any kind of material that might be on the shell. And one of the main reasons in this country that, that eggs need to be refrigerated, um, there's sort of there's a natural coating uh, that the hen puts on the egg when it's laid called a cuticle, which you really can't see, uh, but it basically seals seals pores on the shell of the egg. There's 300,000 pores on the shell of an egg, microscopic. Uh, so when we wash eggs, we wash that away and kind of open those up. Uh, so an egg that's unwashed uh, can do quite well out of refrigeration because, because of that cuticle. An egg that's washed really needs to be refrigerated uh, or it will deteriorate somewhat quickly. It's an interesting fact. Oh, I didn't know that. So you mentioned, I mean, we, we, you talked a little bit about, about timeline as far as when, how long the eggs stay at, at the farm. But what, what, what is the timeline of an egg? I mean, is there a particular timeline in which it can be considered or labeled fresh? I mean, how regulated is that? And then as far as consumption, I mean, I know that, that eggs I've had in my fridge can be good after, you know, months. So what, right. what's, what are the standards um, that you guys have to adhere to? It always kind of cracks me up because the, the USDA, uh, sort of how they describe the litmus test for is an egg okay is, does it look like an egg, and does it smell like an egg, or not smell like something else? I guess. Um, so it's it's really soft on expiration codes. We generally put uh, a 45 day expiration code on our eggs at uh, use by, but it can go it can go a good bit longer. Um, eggs really do keep remarkably well, especially in in refrigeration. I mean, it can go it can go months. One thing uh, we we typically like to process the eggs uh, within a week of of being in our processing plant, so that you know, that that egg uh, will be no more than no more than two weeks old at the oldest by the time it hits store shelves, really, or very close to it. And that's that's kind of the end of it. Usually, usually it's within days uh, that the eggs are are through our system and, and out. And we know we're doing a good job when we start to get complaints uh, from people about having trouble hard boiling our eggs, right. or they're <laughs> complaining that uh, that the whites are cloudy. Uh, there's something wrong with your eggs. The whites are cloudy. Well, they're really fresh. <laughs> that's, that's what happens. And then hard-boiled eggs, of course, they, they won't peel if they're too fresh. They need to be at least a couple weeks old uh, to peel well, at least. So 
It's always funny. People get upset about those things. <laughs> um, well, there's a couple other things I want to touch on. We're almost out of time. I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit about some of the other uh, sustainability initiatives that you guys have taken on. Um, you know, in particular, the packaging for your eggs, and then maybe if you can just very briefly talk about the refrigeration systems that you guys are using. Sure. Yeah, we're we're using with the packaging. Uh, we're, we're pretty proud of it because it's it's a uh, it's a hundred percent recycled plastic soda bottle plastic egg carton. Uh, we worked with our supplier to to make that happen, and uh, for a couple reasons. One, it it creates you know, it creates regional demand for recycled soda bottle plastic. And depending on where you are, sometimes there isn't enough demand for it or depending on what the market is doing uh, for recycled plastic. So, you know, it's a, it's a second life on soda bottles, which is really cool. And then with plastic, it, you know, if, it, if it's recycled again, which is what we hope our customers are doing, it uh, it can have, you know, at least seven more lives as, uh, you know, other products or egg cartons again after that. Um, the other... Uh, the other component to the, uh, the recycled plastic is that it actually really takes care of the eggs very well. We have less damage, which again means less wasted food and less food miles and, and everything else. And our customers can, can see the product. It's, uh, you know, it's clear. They can see if the eggs are good and how they look. So, uh, so that's, been, that's been great. And we're working on uh, working with the carton manufacturers on a, on a, uh, a new carton that will actually have 20% less plastic just out of some of the design elements. So that's, that's pretty cool, too. Um, people don't, you know, realize they think that pulp egg cartons are, are sort of the best in terms of a carbon footprint, but they're they're really not um, because it takes so much energy to to actually form and, and dry those egg cartons when they're made. I mean, the, the biggest cost uh, of an of an egg carton is actually uh, the energy used to to dry it, and people assume that if they throw something away, it's going to biodegrade, and it and it doesn't. Um, you know, they we've actually dug into landfills, not we, scientists have dug into landfills and uh, dug up newspapers from the 1930s and been able to read them. Uh, you know, in a landfill, when things are away from oxygen, they don't break down. So unless you're composting a cardboard egg carton, it's going to be around for a while, too. Uh, but uh, your, your other question on uh, the refrigeration, uh, I'm also pretty proud of that. and We were very fortunate to come across a company called Free Air, and they developed a system... Uh, which is great for our northern climate, where it actually uh, measures the temperature in our cooler, outside of our cooler, and uh, has a computer controller that shuts down our refrigeration systems if the uh, temperature outside is below 45 degrees, which is what we need to keep our coolers at. And the, the system pulls in air from the outside. Um, so it's been a, I mean, a tremendous energy savings for us, uh, tremendous carbon output savings. And the other thing that's pretty cool about it is refrigeration systems are really dumb, and they just keep running no matter you know, whether they're getting colder <laughs> or not. Uh, they just run and run and run. And this thing measures the, uh, sort of the air handlers and shuts the compressors down and saves a lot of energy, too. So it's a, you know, it's a simple, relatively simple thing, you know, not, not a huge expense, but uh, it saved a lot of energy. And we're trying to do you know, all, all the little things we can with, with uh, you know windows in the barns, and we can shut down you know lights in the barns during the day for the hens that are in there, and and you know that there's enough light, and and using uh, fluorescent bulbs or or even LED uh, lights you know to, to conserve energy. Uh, it's it's always fun too. It's just you know keeping up with the trying to keep up with the cutting edge of what's going on out there. Yeah, lots of opportunities for that. Well, Jesse. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I, I know I would love to have you back because I have a ton of unanswered questions. Um, so much fascinating stuff to talk about. People can learn more about Pete and Jerry's by visiting the website, www.peteandjerry's.com. And please tune in next Thursday for another episode of The Farm Report, 1 o'clock. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening to this program on the Heritage Radio Network. You can find all of our archived programs on heritageradionetwork.com, as well as a schedule of upcoming live shows. You can also podcast all of our programs on iTunes by searching Heritage Radio Network in the iTunes Store. You can find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for up-to-date news and information. Thanks for listening. 
Can the fish come back to South Street? On December 18th, the New Amsterdam Market will pay homage to the old Fulton Fish Market by including a special section dedicated to the fisheries of the Northeast and New England with the Sea to Table. Sea to Table partners with fishermen in the recovering fisheries of the Northeast. Their transparent model, delivering fish direct from docks to chefs across America, supports the traditional fisheries that are crucial to the survival of our working waterfronts. For the first time, Sea to Table will join the market to offer fresh fish direct from independent Northeast fishermen. The collaboration of Sea to Table with New Amsterdam will take us back in time for a day to the era when fishmongers dominated Lower Manhattan. So stop by the New Amsterdam market at Peck Slip and South Street in Manhattan on December 18th and support your local fishermen and fisheries. For more information on Sea to Table, visit www.c2table.com. That's C-S-E-A, the number two, table.com.